The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to a webinar from the Promise Neighborhoods Institute at PolicyLink on youth, family, and community engagement in Promise Neighborhoods. Uh, this is one of many webinars that we have been offering as part of the Continuum of Solutions webinar series to really help uh, accelerate your work um, and build your capacity to deliver results in your communities. So for today's webinar, um, the goals will be for folks to learn the benefits of youth and community engagement to a Promise Neighborhood strategy and to access best practices, tools, and resources to help Promise Neighborhoods engage and include uh, youth and community members as partners in the planning and implementation of the Promise Neighborhood. A little bit of um, background in terms of the agenda. Uh, I'll be presenting first. My name is Samuel Sinyangwe. I'm a program coordinator at the Promise Neighborhoods Institute at PolicyLink. Uh, and then we will hear a presentation from Tanya Staples, who is the Director of Community Engagement at Buffalo Promise Neighborhood. Um, and then a, the second presentation will be from uh, Sheena Collier, Pro Project Director at the Boston Promise Initiative. Um, and then finally, we will have a section for questions and answers at the end. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the chat box at the bottom of your control panel. And then during the Q&A section, we will be responding to your questions. And finally, yes, this webinar is being recorded, and we will post it um, online to all participants um, who have joined today. Uh, I'll send out an email afterwards. So why engage community members? Um, there's a rich uh, history uh, and literature out there uh, that describes the benefits of engaging community members in community change work. Uh, and that's because community members have a unique perspective on neighborhood conditions. Uh, oftentimes, they're able to experience um, the various aspects of the neighborhood, whether it's safety, whether it's uh, the quality of education, the quality of, um, of health resources, and other things in the neighborhood. They really uh, sit at the, at the intersection of all of the different aspects uh, of the Promise neighborhood. So they are best positioned to really uh, provide a perspective on how these are all integrating and what the total experience of living in the neighborhood is like. Um, as a consequence, uh, community members are also well situated to know what's needed in the neighborhood, where things are falling short, um, and where there are areas of improvement to really um, help catapult their efforts to um, reach educational and economic success. Um, also, engaging community members lends legitimacy and cred credibility to the initiative uh, because their primary mo motivation is to improve neighborhood conditions. Uh, engaging community members also uh, contributes to the sustainability of the initiative, it cultivates new leaders, um, and also um, builds the uh, number of folks who are involved and who can be leveraged to really advance this work. And then finally, engaging community members contributes important skills and strengths to, the, to neighborhood improvement. It's also important to engage youth. Um, engaging youth is critical because they contribute to contemporary real world and real school experiences. Um, oftentimes, the best way to understand uh, what's going on in the school um, and where there are areas of improvement is really to ask the youth themselves uh, for their experiences. Um, and in part, in, as a result of doing that, it can help generate new ways of describing problems and solutions. Oftentimes, youth bring uh, a unique um, repertoire of skills and uh, ways of thinking um, that are new and helpful to the initiative, whether it's um, in how to use technology effectively and social media, whether it's um, in thinking about how to um, how youth can be ambassadors for other youth to be involved um, and really role models for other youth in the community. Engaging youth is also important because they can obtain more authentic and reliable information from their peers and other community members. Uh, and then finally, youth can be highly effective advocates who provide compelling firsthand testimony before school boards, legislatures, funders and other decision makers. Uh, a number of Promise Neighborhood sites have uh, engaged young people uh, in advocating for the funding the Promise Neighborhood Initiative, in particular um, thinking about Berea Promise Neighborhood, which actually brought uh, a group of about 20 uh, high school youth um, to DC to really help uh, advocate effectively for the benefits of the Promise Neighborhood. And finally, engaging youth is important because they become the leaders of tomorrow who can sustain the initiative's momentum and success. Um, even looking at the Harlem Children's Zone, for example, and how many of the folks who have actually um, 
graduated from um, the school there and gone off to college have come back um, and been really effective leaders um, who understand the model and who are able to advance it to the, and take it to the next level. And so with that background, I'd like to lift up some examples from the field. So we have two presenters today who will really give us a snapshot of the work going on uh, in two Promise neighborhoods to engage youth families and community members in the initiative. Um, both of these are implementation sites. Um, and so you will really hear how um, a fully functioning Promise neighborhood is able to uh, engage these stakeholders effectively uh, and leverage their assets to advance uh, the cradle to career strategy. And so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Tanya Staples uh, from Buffalo Promise Neighborhood to really give us a picture of the work going on there. Hello, Tanya. Are you on the line? I'm on the line. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. OK. So what you see on the first slide here, participate in the process to change the community and fulfill the promise. This is a tagline that was created by members of our Buffalo Promise Neighborhood Community Council. They felt that it was critically important that as we began to invite other community residents and stakeholders in, we had something that could be very powerful and that could hit people where they were. And so in order to affect change within the community, it's very important that people come out and participate. And then uh, to change the community. And when you start to talk about and fulfill the promise, the promise is, as an individual defines what the promise may be for them. The promise may be securing higher education, securing employment, a safe community. Whatever that promise is for the future, each individual would have a role to play in that, and they would be responsible for fulfilling the individual as well as community's promise. So just a little background on Buffalo Promise Neighborhood. Um, we are one square mile within the city of Buffalo. We're in the northeast section of the community. And within our Promise Neighborhood footprint, there are approximately 12,000 residents, 4,800 4, housing units. Um, we have about 82% single female headed households. We're also in a neighborhood that has a lot of crime in the area. Um, a lot of shooting, gang activities, um, burglaries, thefts, part one crimes exist in this particular neighborhood. Unemployment is relatively high. This is also a community that has a very stable senior population, as well as a lot of young people that reside in this particular neighborhood. And it is a neighborhood that was felt, if there wasn't some attention paid to it, this could very easily um, decline rapidly. You know, this isn't one of the worst neighborhoods in the city of Buffalo, but again, without some attention and without um, some effort being made, this neighborhood would rapidly decline. This is a process that we engaged in, and I want to try to take you through it um, quickly. When we first started in 2011, and I came on board when we were moving from the planning grant to the implementation stage. And so there was a VPN steering committee that was established. And it was made up of individuals who were of, of influence and affluence within the community, those people who knew what was going on. There were faith-based leaders, elected officials, law enforcement, block club representatives, um, other members of the community. Uh, there were some not-for-profit organizations that existed, so they had representation. There was approximately 25, 30 people that sat on that steering committee. And initially, their goal was to begin to understand what Promise Neighborhood was all about and be that voice and that face for the individuals within the community. So they were there. Um, they were listening. They were giving us advice. And they were giving us feedback as we were going through the process of implementation, um, preparing for implementation, and hosting a variety of community meetings. From there, we decided to really look at the concept of community organizing. What is community organizing? How do we help build the capacity? And I think that's one of the things that you'll hear throughout is we spend a lot of time, energy, and effort around building capacity of our resident um, leaders and our resident members. And so we brought in um, Jim Caprero, who did some work with us around community organizing. And so he took this group of uh, steering committee members and really took them through an extended training component. And out of that training, 
the residents were asked to identify other residents in the community where we could conduct one-to-one -one relational interviews with them, utilizing the SWOT model, what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, as the residents saw that. And so over a two-month period of time, approximately 125, 130 interviews were conducted. That information was brought back, and as it was synthesized, the information really started to break out into eight very distinct areas of interest and concern for the um, community. And it involved housing and neighborhood revitalization, health, education, crime and safety, youth development, economic development, community engagement, and employment. And so that's where you see um, we wanted to be able to present this information to the community, but we didn't want the information coming from Buffalo Promise neighborhood representatives. And so the community residents, they began to put the presentations together, you know, how they would convey it without necessarily using something that was just so data-driven and so many statistics that people wouldn't really grasp a hold on but really trying to, again, meet people where they were and present the stories of the past and what the present looked like and what the potential future could look like for this neighborhood. And so we had eight community residents to tell their story. Following that, we went into a community visioning exercise. And then we also asked the, the individuals in attendance, and we had a few hundred people there, um, if you want or if you aspire to have the type of community that was presented today and that you've also uh, echoed in that you want to have, then what is your commitment? And so we did have commitment cards and residents then completed the commitment cards identifying which of the eight, and I call them bucket areas, but which of the eight areas did they see themselves participating and having a role? And from that, we went um, into training around the results-based accountability framework, helping the, the residents to understand that, you know, what is your ultimate result? Where do, you, where do you see the community within a very specific period of time? How are you going to get there? How are you going to measure it? Um, understanding what is, what is the story behind the data as we see it. You know, there's a lot of assumptions that are being made regarding things happening in the community or why the community is in the state or the condition that it's in but really understanding um, what, what happened here, um, what are some of the potential losses that will occur as the community starts to change, what would be an individual loss, what would be a community loss, what is, again, what is the perception there. And so we had members that were coming and they were participating um, on a steady basis. And the way we set it up, we would have all eight meetings on the same night in the same venue because our staff strength was at that particular time, there was only two of us. And so we needed to be able to manage the efforts and the activities of the larger group. And we probably had, at that time, maybe a couple hundred people, 40 people were working with, within each of the eight groups. So, um, so we needed to manage that, and the groups would meet uh, once, once a month and for about a two and a half, three hour period of time. And we also fed them dinner. So after that, um, the group really started, you know, it was starting to sink in, and they were thinking about what is their role, um, what do they envision the role that they're going to play, how are they going to convey the work that's happening to the other folks in the community, how are they going to get other people to come to the table and do the work that's necessary to be done. And so you started to see a shift in, in the mindset and a shift in the um, level of responsibility and accountability that was happening there. And I say that to say because when we started out, we had a steering committee. And I often say it was a time when Buffalo Promise Neighborhood staff would come. We would share what we were doing as far as moving towards implementation. We would get their feedback, but it was at a point where we just had people pretty much agreeing and nodding their heads and saying, okay, we think this is what should be happening. We agree with you. You know, there would be some opposition on occasion, but for the most part, I, I frame it as being a dog and pony type of show. But at this point in the process, we had the members saying, okay, what do we need to do? How do we take more control that this organization coming in here, you're, you're one of many organizations that have attempted to do something in this neighborhood, and you get us all jazzed up about change and things that were going to happen, and then you go away and we're still left in the same, same um same situation. 
So then the Buffalo Primus Neighborhood Steering Committee then formed itself as being a community council. And again, um, I'll share, you, share with you later where they developed a mission statement, a vision statement, value statement, and some accountability um, for themselves. So as we're going through this process, we're meeting with the um, eight commissions. Each commission has a facilitator, and that facilitator was a member of, of, from the community, a business leader, a resident, a block club leader that was there to help facilitate the process as we were going through creating the strategies within the eight bucket areas. And then as we continue through this process, uh, results-based accountability and the, and the framework of adaptive leadership was also uh, interwoven into the process. So what you see before you here, this was the uh, Community Council's mission statement, vision statement, the core values, and their value statement. And it's saying that the Buffalo Promise Neighborhood Community Council is held accountable by the community and committed to the mission and the values. And then this was the uh, quality of life vision statement that was created. And again, these were um, statements or values that were really developed and driven um, by the community residents. So the structure that, um, that we're engaged in or involved in here, we have our foundation board in the Buffalo Promise neighborhood and the BPN engagement staff. Um, we currently have four individuals that are working on our engagement team. And part of our funding that we received came from LIFT uh, Buffalo for engagement activities. So while we were moving along the path of the eight bucket areas that you see below, we had some resources that also contributed to um, rolling out some of the strategies that the, team, the teams were proposing, and specifically dollars that came through Department of Justice, uh, the Crime and Safety Initiative, and also through uh, Department of Education uh, supplemental funding. So as we're working through this, uh, one of the things that came out was we had eight areas. And then it became um, labor intensive. It became very overwhelming. And yet there were points of activity that were totally overlapping. And so the group then decided we need to scale down. And we really need to look at what our priorities are, what are the things that are manageable, and again, where the overlap exists, and how do we work collaboratively together. So this is the breakdown at this particular point. We have five commissions that are operating. And again, they're being led by resident facilitators. And within each of the areas below, these are some of the strategies that we are working on. And so what they found was, or I guess part of the, um, the angst with the group is that they really wanted to continue to recruit and bring more people on. And then part of the group felt as though, how do we bring people on if we are not having action? If people can't see things actually happening, if people can't uh, imagine the successes that we're having, or even the failures that we're having, so that we're beginning to learn from the activities and go forward. And so trying to, in some cases, slow the group down at different points and have them to really understand and, and, and really try to learn more about the community than, again, I think what some of the assumptions were. And that's why I think through the adaptive leadership process or the adaptive leadership framework, it's really you know, getting people at a higher level and having them to look broadly and having them to look at systems that are existing within the community and how, do, how can they affect change and what is the role of a leader and what's the role of or the presumed authority that a person may have in a particular situation and the difference between the two of them. Because they began to fit, feel, as we were going through different um, uh, strategy development sessions, that if Buffalo Promise Neighborhood was not at the helm of a particular initiative, that these initiatives would not go forward. And so again, the transference of the ownership of the, the problem and also the solution. And the solution wasn't within the Buffalo Promise neighborhood staff being there, but the solutions and the activity and work that was going to happen was going to come from the staff. And so while they were seeing us as the authority figures to be able to move their initiatives forward, they needed to transfer and 
understand that they were actually the authority figures. And so once there was a mind shift and a, and a change in, in thought, then we started to see more and more of the activities really become community-initiated activities where Buffalo Promise neighborhood staff was just taking a back seat and helping with, um, helping with the logistics of the work that needed to be done. So we have an activity, for instance, um, with our youth development team. And so we're sitting at, the, sitting at the table, and you have a group of adults there. And the conversation is, um, we're, we want to create a youth summit because we're trying to understand misdirected youth and what that means. But yet there was no young people sitting there. And then the light bulb went off. We've got to have young people sitting at the table. They have to help to drive this particular initiative. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer learning that begins to take place, reaching out, having uh, the young people speak the same language to the other young people that are in the community. And so the charge of the group was to go out and really begin to recruit and bring young people to the table. They were able to get young people there, but then the funny thing happened is as they're listening to young people, they wanted to disagree with their, with their thought process or the solutions that they were putting on the table. And so again, it's having, it's having a group of residents to step back and really say, if you want to uh, affect change, you're going to have to be open and the willingness of change to happen and bringing in other uh, perspectives and other thoughts into, into the process of the work that we're doing. So these are the five uh, bucket areas that we're working on, our crime and safety, neighborhood revitalization, economic development, community engagement, and youth development. And there are specific um, strategies and accountabilities within each of these areas. And so as we begin to um, prioritize the work that we're doing, understanding that some are going to be short-term and some are long-term strategies, and what is the amount of time that a particular resident has to commit to an activity? It's so easy for our, our residents to get overwhelmed because you have a handful of people that are there every time there's an activity, there's a meeting, they're there and they're willing to work, but the burnout is happening at an enormous rate. So being able to be flexible enough for the residents to understand that people will come and contribute what they have to contribute when they feel that it's necessary to do so. Um, and as a part of our, our accountability and being able to collect the data around the work that we're doing, we were really struggling with that initially. How do we measure? How do we measure the impact that we're having? How do we know that any of the capacity building efforts that are underway are really making an impact? And so what we started to do is look at developing an internal uh, data system, specifically around community engagement, and bringing in all of the attendance sheets, all of the activity sheets that we've had throughout the process since 2011 and categorize them into activities that the residents were engaged in. And then start to look at what are some of the patterns. So if we have um, individuals that have gone through some type of capacity um, development training, are they stepping up now into more leadership kinds of roles? Are they looking at how do we organize a block club or they're going to take on an activity and begin to organize it and, and do all of the necessary components of that activity? Or do we have those steady volunteers that are just going to be those that are going to come at every juncture and go out and do the work? Do we have uh, volunteers that are coming out or community residents coming out as ambassadors for the work that, that's happening? So being able to measure the participation level and the level um, that they are working within a particular activity. Are they a participant or are they an activity leader? Um, also, we're curious to understand how many of these are truly community-initiated activities. So we wanted to be able to differentiate between things that Buffalo Promise Neighborhood as a whole would like to do and have community residents involved in versus those that the community residents say, you know, we really need to do a food drive or maybe we're going to do a community cleanup. Um, we're going to do possibly the um, stop and shovel program. So what are the things that they're going to come up with and um, versus what we come up with? We're working with the University of Buffalo. Um, 
with law enforcement officials in terms of our crime tracking data, but also making sure that we're looking at the data and how it aligns with the strategies. So, for instance, we have the um, Bailey Avenue Business Code of Conduct, and that was one of the components that was um, initiated out of the adaptive leadership process. When the residents were thinking about these delis are really wreaking havoc in our community, there's a lot of uh, illegal activity happening there, um, there's gang activity going on, they're selling illegal products, expired products, and we want them closed. And so they know that these efforts they tried previously to close down the delis didn't work, but thinking, okay, how do we come up with another strategy? And the strategy being is that we would partner with the delis and establish a code of conduct. And so the code of conduct is in place, and it's a matter of the residents going out meeting with the business owners. So you begin to have, again, that ownership, that connection, talking with the business to achieve a win-win, and those kinds of things happen. So, but how do we track it? How do we look, at, look to see that the efforts of the residents um, align with the, with the data? So we know that we have the problem data, uh, delis in the area. We know that the police department is being called there. We know that there's been gunshots there. You know, we know all of these things, but now looking at the efforts of the code of conduct program, we begin to see if there's a reduction in any of the negative behaviors that are going on in the community. Um, the other thing that uh, the residents, in terms of housing stabilization and revitalization, um, there's a lot of properties that I said previously, we do have a pretty stable housing stock in Buffalo. However, there is about 5% that are just really blighted, abandoned properties here. And so how do we now begin to track that? There is no tracking system within the city of Buffalo. And the residents were really curious about that. So in working with partners, working with other partners, they developed a windshield survey. And then there were a group of residents that went out street by street and began to complete the survey. And now they are on the verge of having this tracking system that would also tie into other beautification projects. But more importantly, it would then develop a housing strategy for the neighborhood that they can meet with elected officials and other funders and begin to advocate on behalf of themselves for an improved um, community. In terms of our accountabilities, we do have service agreements with our partner organizations. So if there are organizations that we're working with, like the Buffalo Urban League, who is doing um, a youth referral program, so residents have an opportunity if they identify young people who seem to be in need of additional services, they can refer them to the Buffalo Urban League, and the Buffalo Urban League has specific outcomes that they are being measured against. But more importantly, again, looking at resident involvement, resident making the connection with the organization, and then seeing how the youth are now engaged in more positive kinds of activities within the community. We do community briefings on a quarterly basis. We also, as I said previously, have our community uh, council meetings where we meet with the steering committee of uh, the leadership of the council as well as the leadership of the eight commissions, and we have our, our monthly meetings. And then we also have um, our monthly internal data meetings where we look at the data associated with each of our initiatives and review and discuss and determine whether or not these are the type of metrics that we should be looking at or are there other things that we need to consider. All of this is going to ultimately tie into the BPN Promise Net system. It's a system that uh, we've worked with the Buffalo School District and Niagara IT and Say Yes Buffalo in creating a system specifically so that we can go in and our partner organizations could go in and we could have individualized data and understand the activity of individuals within our Buffalo Promise neighborhood footprint. Some of the challenges um, that we found over the past couple of years is that it has been difficult engaging the young people specifically in the community engagement efforts. We tend to have a lot of older, mature, seasoned individuals and I'm saying pretty much 55 years and older that have been involved because they've lived in the community for such a period of time. Um, they have a tendency to be the homeowners of the property, but yet we have a growing population of the 24 to 35-year-olds. 
So trying to get those young people involved in these particular efforts um, has been challenging. Also, the hard to reach populations that we're terming as our renters and our absentee landlords. We're in a community where uh, there's a lot of flipping, housing flipping that occurs, and we have a lot of landlords that live out of town. And there's also a large um, population of university, college students from the University of Buffalo that resides within our communities, and there is just no, no structure around the kind of activity that goes on in those properties, and the landlords aren't here to hold accountable. Uh, time commitments for our volunteers, we tend to ask a lot because there's a lot of things that they want to do and they're trying to do, which means you need people there all the time. So you have time commitments between work and other activities that the volunteers may be involved in, which consequently is going to result in volunteer burnout. Trust, um, we came into the community, and again, there has been so many initiatives that have happened over the years where there's this plan and there's that plan, and then the organization goes away and the community is in the same condition, and they haven't been able to really coalesce with one another and, and have that uh, social, social uh, efficacy to move on, or community efficacy to be able to move on and continue down the path that they were once going. Compensation versus long-term community benefits. What we found with some of the community residents um, with this work is that there's a, a, a tension that they feel as if there's some compensation that should be coming down the, down the way for them. We did at one point attempt to do gift cards as a way of saying, you know, you're doing a great job, this may help with your gas cost or some other cost that you may have, but then you, 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 you think about what is going to be the long-term community benefit if we continue to equip and build capacity of our community residents that well beyond Buffalo Promise, Promise neighborhood, these efforts should be sustained and then you're going to see a better, healthier community. Um, another challenge is that quick action, quick resolution. Again, trying to go into action to achieve a quick resolution that may not be the resolution that's needed for that particular situation. And then finally, it's just the fear of retaliation. We have some residents that refuse to get involved in the process because as change happens, it's also affecting the predators that may be in the community. Um, change will, will, will make the residents have to call into the 311 system more, um, call into 911, hold people accountable for their actions, and there is a fear of potential retaliation. Uh, there's, I think, still a lot of opportunity um, Within the community, you know, we're establishing great, wonderful relationships with our block clubs. We're looking at um, block clubs expanding. There's interest in establishing additional block clubs. Law enforcement partners are out and about. Uh, a sense of crea creating an increased community ownership. And then I think a, a really important piece is that as the efforts are happening, and elected officials and other community leaders are seeing the efforts by the community residents that now the residents in our community have a voice. You know, there was a group of um, business owners that were able to sit down with the mayor and talk about uh, their strategies and also their needs and what their expectations are from the elected officials in our effort, in our, in our footprint. Um, and then I would say that community silos are broken you know, we're working in a community and there's different factions within the community, but looking at how do we break down those silos so that we have diverse representation of the entire community in the revitalization effort. Um, listed here are just some of the things that we've been able to accomplish um, through the community uh, revitalization effort. And again, these are things that it, it took a while to get to the point of having the residents um, own, initiate, take on, follow through on the project, and uh, BPN staff, again, just providing the logistics and the framework and the um, backroom kind of support for the efforts that are, that, are, that are taking place. I think we're running out of time. And then these are just some physical um, changes that have happened. We built, constructed a $3.5 million um, children's academy 
and again along the commercial strip, uh, really working with the um, block club leaders in revitalizing the community garden. This was a garden that had a really tragic story. A young lady died in a fire, and the community had promised the parents 14 years ago they were going to turn this around, and this would be a place of peace where they could come and remember their daughter. And it took them 14 years to do that. And that's because of there's just so many people were involved in the process, and there was no one taking ownership of the project to move it move it forward. So that was one of the benefits of coming in and helping them to create the structure that the community needed to move forward the project. We're doing a lot in terms of housing acquisition, um, trying to remove the number of blighted and abandoned properties, and working with uh, Belmont Housing and a private foundation. Uh, we have now uh, 10 properties that have been acquired. And then also working with the city of Buffalo around clean sweeps, which have resulted in block clubs now doing their own community clean sweeps. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. That was an excellent presentation. Um, and so now I'm going to transition to uh, Sheena, Sheena Collier, who is the project director of the uh, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, which is the lead agency of the Boston Promise Initiative. Um, and just a little bit of background, um, Dudley Street has been engaging the community and engaging youth, and it's really been a model of this for uh, decades now. And so, uh, it's really exciting to see how that work has translated into the, their Promise Neighborhood effort. I'm muted. Oh, we can hear there you, you are. Ah, all right, great. Um, so, thank you. Um, uh, Tanya for that and Sam for the introduction. Um, I wanted to kind of to build off of some of what Sam just mentioned about DSNI um, and really who Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative is and how um, becoming part of Promise Neighborhoods was really an excellent fit for us building off of the work we've been doing for the last 30 years. Um, and then I'll give a little bit about the actual structure, how we are structuring Promise and how that incorporates youth um, families in the community into the way that we are actually implementing and then give some um, really the engagement of residents is all is what we do and so I'll just give some quick examples of some ways that that's actually been operationalized um, through Promise and then just some some highlights from our last fiscal year. So you'll see here um, just a mission statement of the SNI and I wanted to start with that because um, again empowering residents is in our mission statement and it's it's really what drives all of our work and so um, this is our 30th year we started in 1984 and it came out of residents in the neighborhood who were not happy with the conditions in the neighborhood um, and were feeling disempowered excuse me it came together specifically um, around the physical landscape of the neighborhood and created a, a Don't Dump on Us campaign. There was a lot of trash dumping that was happening in the neighborhood. And from there, DSNI was born. And so you, we really, um, as we are approaching any piece of work that we're doing, this piece around residents organizing, planning, creating, controlling is what really is important to us and um, is incorporated throughout our Promise neighborhood. Another important thing I want to um, highlight around DSNI as an organization and the lead agency for Promise is our board of directors and our board structure. And so you'll see that we have 35 total seats on our board um, and we do elections every two years. And some of the key highlights on here, uh, 20 of those 35 board members are actual residents. And a decision was made long ago to be very intentional about the board seats reflecting who was in the neighborhood. And so you'll see that there are four, this is not, it's not proportional to um, the size of different race and ethnicities that are in the neighborhood, but these are the major um, racial and ethnic groups that make up our, our neighborhood. And so a decision was made that there should be four seats um, to make sure that everyone is evenly represented. And then um, maybe about 10 or 15 years into DSNI, we had our first youth board member, and now that has grown into there also being a designated four seats for youth. And so these are all residents. They have to live in 
within what we call the Dudley Village Campus, um, which is the boundaries of our neighborhood, um, which later became our actually founders of our Promise neighborhood. And then you'll see below that there's other um, people that make up the board of directors. And again, these are all um, either resident, either residents of the neighborhood or businesses and institutions that are located physically located within the neighborhood um, and serve our residents. And again, so this is just another illustration of it. Um, so we have our community, our larger community of 24,000 residents, about 24 to 25,000 residents. Um, from there, there are people that um, are actual members and choose to be a part of DSNI. And from that body um, is elected the DSNI Board of Directors who then um, guides the staff and the work that we do. The um, bubble off to the left of the Board of Directors is um, a piece of our subsidiary, subsidiary we have called Dudley Neighbors, Inc. So I mentioned that DSNI really grew out of, initially out of um, planning for and controlling land in the neighborhood. And so about five years into our um, existence, we created a subsidiary where we actually have an urban land trust um, where we were giving imminent, imminent domain um, of a number of acres of land in the neighborhood. And so that's a piece of work that we also do. So out of um, this resident-led board that we have um, came this interest and eventually application in, in Promise Neighborhoods. And so in 2010, um, we were granted a planning grant around Promise, and, and then later an implementation grant in 2012. And in between that time, a lot of what happened and what continues to happen were these working groups in the neighborhood made up of residents as well as um, partner organizations who came together. Um, at that time, we didn't have um, the specific indicators through Promise neighborhoods that we have right now, but there was a, an idea of what are the areas of concern and areas of opportunity in the neighborhood. So we had a work group around housing. We had work groups around early childhood education, et cetera. And on those work groups were residents as well as um, community organizations coming together to say, what, is, what do we already know about this neighborhood? What data do we have? And what do we want to see? Um, and that was the basis for our implementation application, um, which uh, we were awarded in 2012 based off that work that residents had done and, and community members had done to say, this is what we want our neighborhood to look like. And so if you've ever seen our application, our proposal to the Department of Ed, it's, um, there's a lot in it. And it, it really um, captures the vision that came out of this process. Um, and so we've been working over the last year and a half or so to actually put that vision into practice. One of the ways that we're doing that is through how we actually structure promise. And so you will see here um, what we, we call our working groups. And some of our working groups are communities of practice, our roundtables, or teams. But essentially, this is how we are getting the work of promise done and continuing to incorporate our um, residents, parents from the neighborhood um, who may or may not be residents because we do have um, a busing, an assignment system in Boston where you may or may not be going to school in your neighborhood. So we also are outreaching to parents that whose children go to the schools in the neighborhood. Um, so we have our implementation team and just in the little boxes kind of off um, to the right of the box to the groups are what DSNI staff member is the lead on that particular group. Our implementation team is essentially the steering committee of Promise, and I'll speak a little bit more about that in a second, of who's on that team and, and what the function is. Um, and then you have a number of work groups that span across this continuum. And so school readiness and birth to five um, focus on the, the birth to five, the early childhood part of the continuum, with the school readiness roundtable really being the place where we are talking about parent engagement um, around school readiness factors, and birth to five is more around what can providers and teachers in the neighborhood be doing. Um, so those two teams are counterparts to each other. Um, the same with the K through eight community of practice and the love committee off um, at the end, with the community practice really being the 
um, schools, principals, and other providers in the neighborhood um, coming together around education, um, really K-3 education. And then the Love Committee, Love Standing for Learning Our Value in Education, is a space for where parents are and um, community members, whether or not their parents are um, coming up with strategies for how do we integrate learning throughout our neighborhood. And then the last two, um, the Corridors to College Success and Dudley Youth Council. The UIC Dudley Youth Council is, actually, is made up of youth who are um, youth that live in a neighborhood or who have been served through DSNI throughout the years and are coming together around what are our youth strategies. And the Corridors to College Success is um, actually a matching, some matching funds that we receive through four foundations to really work on the high school to college and career part of the continuum. And so again, that's um, community members and university and high school principals in the neighborhood um, coming together to define what is the, help to define what is the um, high school to college, post-secondary, technical, vocational pathway in the neighborhood and how do we support students to getting there. Just a little bit more information about the implementation team and who's on it. Um, and just wanted to pull this one out in particular because it's really the group that is shepherding the promised vision for um, the Dudley Village campus are for the SNI. And so this group has, you'll see um, in the blue and the orange, the different stakeholder groups that are on this. Um, the, some really important pieces around the three residents and DSNI board members. So I mentioned that our board members are residents, and so we wanted to make sure that th there's DSNI board representation on this team um, because with DSNI being the lead agency, our board does have the ultimate responsibility of making sure that promise is implemented and um, our targets are met. And then we also have under the affinity group piece. Um, is where our community representatives come in. So it could be community, meaning our community partners, or also um, other youth and parents in the community that are not already serving on our board. And that team has um, really the charge of continuing to move Promise forward. Um, the reason why it's separate from our actual DSNI board, our board is charged with governing all of DSNI. Um, and so as I mentioned, we have Promise is um, a huge piece of what we do and integrate it into all of our work. And we also continue to do our land trust work and our um, housing advocacy, et cetera. So the DSNI board is over all of that, whereas the implementation team is really looking specifically at Promise um, indicators as well as um, our own indicators that we've come up with to say, um, are we being successful in moving it forward? And then. Um, doing that through these three particular focus areas that I have listed here. And so the communications and outreach piece is really like how do we make sure that Promise lives in the neighborhood and in the community um, and that we have messaging and that residents are really, um, whether or not they are participating in something in a Promise neighborhood program or strategy that um, they are understand that they are a part of it um, and that it's really to transform our neighborhood. Progress and outcomes, there's a, that's the subset of the implementation team that is looking at um, specifically the indicators and are we moving the indicators and then the sustainability and policy. Just a, a, a couple of things I didn't mention about the working groups. Each of those working groups is responsible for a set of the promise indicators or the GIPRAs and so they're coming together monthly we're actually um, ramping up in our target setting process now. And Tanya had mentioned the re results-based accountability and really going through that process with all of these stakeholders at the table. Um, we, did, we did that, I mentioned we did some of that pre-promise or even in the planning phase. But now that we have, um, in that time since we've done that, we have clearer um, guidance, our data guidance, et cetera, to be able to say, okay, these are specifically the indicators that we need to move. And so each of those working groups owns a set of indicators and is responsible for setting the targets um, and or there may be people or groups on the team that are also responsible for some of the implementation. And each of them um, is led by staff and then co-led by either a resident or a community partner. 
um, particularly the ones that I mentioned are counterparts to the organizational team. So the School Readiness Roundtable, which is about parent engagement, led by our zero to five manager, and then co-led with a, um, a parent. Um, and then groups like our zero to five work group, which is really about how do we work on quality, um, early childhood in the neighborhood, um, make sure that children are being screened, et cetera, um, led by one of our staff and co-led by one of our community partners. So um, the next couple of slides, what I wanted to do, I mentioned at the beginning that um, the youth, family, and community engagement is, is really integrated into everything we do. And so I wanted to just give a snapshot of some of the things that we've done, particularly over the past year, um, that has highlighted, um, that highlights how we are continuing to do that stuff and implementing it through Promise. And so I'm going to go through, I think, maybe two or three examples and then um, talk about how, um, if people want further information, how we can, um, how I can get that to you. So the neighborhood survey. Um, that we did this past year. Uh, every Promise site is required to do a neighborhood survey. And so we took this as an opportunity, though, though it was a requirement, to also gather data about our neighborhood um, on things that we, we were also interested in. We hadn't done a full neighborhood survey like this since, I, I think, the mid-90s. Um, we, we do surveying a lot, but a really full-scale um, neighborhood survey we haven't done in a while. And so the picture that you see here are, is our neighborhood surveyors, our Boston Promise Initiative organizers is what their titles were. Um, and I wanted to highlight this particular, show this particular picture to give an idea of how we really um, lifted up the role of residents in collecting data on their own neighborhood. So we hired at, um, at the end of it we had gone up to hiring 20 surveyors, and of those 20, 14 or 15 were actual residents of the Promise neighborhood. And so the, um, you know, from their own accounts, the experience and the um, perspective it gave them to go door to door and collect data on their neighbors and be able to um, say to their neighbors that DSNI has received this grant and they want to make sure that your voice is heard in the way that it's being utilized in the neighborhood was really powerful for, for the residents. Um, and the feedback that we got from them was just how um, how gave how for some of them it gave them a different perspective of the neighborhood. Um, of of the residents that we hired, um, we ended up um, using probably about we probably put about thirty thousand dollars of Promise neighborhood money back into um, the hands of our residents through through paying the surveyors as well as giving incentives to families. So that was, um, you know, aside from gathering the data and having really rich data now to set our targets, that was really important to us um, to highlight that residents were a big piece of that. Um, this piece, I won't um, go too much into it, but one, another example of how residents have helped to inform the actual strategies and programs that are implemented through Promise is Fair Chance for Family Success. So when we were in the phase I mentioned in planning, in the BPI planning phase of doing these focus groups and working groups, um, we started to bring families together to say, what are the barriers um, to you being financially healthy or to your economic mobility in the neighborhood and collected a lot we did a lot of focus groups and collected a lot of data from residents. And eventually from that came this um, strategy that we're implementing called Fair Chance for Family Success, where we're partnering with Family Independence Initiative, which is a national organization, to create family accountability groups in the neighborhood. Um, you'll see on the left, I won't read them, but kind of the steps that we believe, um, the steps that we implemented to take us from engagement to really residents being in control of um, the strategy and others. And then on the right is kind of how it's played out in this particular initiative. So we have 108 families that are involved. Um, they're receiving cash incentives of up to $2,000 a year for tracking data on themselves. And what they do is they meet monthly with their accountability group essentially and say, 
um, here is where I am in setting this goal, um, or in reaching this goal. And they, they receive a laptop computer to track their progress through that. And so this was probably one of our um, best examples of really a resident plans implemented um, and controlled strategy that really um, there's little involvement from actual staff except to help the family groups get started, but it's really on the families to continue to move it forward and collect their data. Um, and we're just giving them the tools to do it. And the last thing I'll highlight is our youth engagement. So one of our strategic focus areas for DSNI is youth opportunities and development. And I mentioned the youth seats on the board, and we've always been focused on how do we, um, through the work that we're doing, ensure that youth are continuing to be leaders in the neighborhood, um, that they have a voice as young people, and that they grow into adulthood and continue to be leaders in the neighborhood. And so something that we piloted this year was Community Planet. Um, and given that youth um, now are, the way that they communicate with each other and with others is really through technology. And so Community Planet, I put the website down here at the bottom, is a way for um, any organization to set up a way to essentially collect data um, online through games. And so um, I just wanted to show you a picture of it. And so, what, what you could do, we set up a game, we set up a couple of games. We had one around healthy food, around food access in the neighborhood, one around arts and culture, and one around the way that we use space. And so what the youth set up was, um, they actually took actual maps from the neighborhood and said, um, you know, here's this location in the neighborhood, or here's a map of the neighborhood, drop a pin here and tell us what you would like to see. It's a vacant lot, um, so let us know what you would like to see. This one, this actual example here is not from our actual survey is from, it's just an example from the site, but it gives you an idea of how um, youth, youth are now able to take what they're already doing, um, they're, they're on Facebook, they're on Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, and really use that to do community planning. And so we had 10 young people ages 14 and 17 who actually worked, worked at DSNI during the year, and this was a piece of what they did, um, and these four bullets were um, what they agreed upon they wanted to do. So getting data, um, creating this environment for public conversation, strengthening the relationship between DSNI and the community, and then they promised that DSNI would use this input in planning um, and really reflecting back issues to the community. And really, and we really have, we've taken it, the, youth, the data that the youth were able to collect really seriously and um, used it even as we were doing our strategic, our work plans for this um, current fiscal year, use the data that the youth were able to collect from Community Planet. Um, I know we're kind of running out of time, so um, I'll, just, I'll kind of end on this. So this was our, um, at the end of this past fiscal year, we did a presentation to our board on kind of where we are um, and how we've continued to engage residents. And so a couple of things I wanted to highlight that I won't get into. The 95 here, we also have two choice neighborhoods in our Promise neighborhood, and so we work we work with them more around the workforce development pieces and making sure that um, local residents are being hired. And so you'll see that 95 local workers were hired through the work that we did um, on choice neighborhoods. Um, the last piece I'll highlight, um, we also engage families through some more traditional ways like newsletters. So you'll see on all the way to the right, we had 600 um, and 50, over 650 newsletters that have been distributed to families throughout the year. And that piece is important because it gives us a way to continue to stay in contact with families with children of different ages, even when they're not involved in actual programming. Um, and then here's just the, the piece again around the survey. I wanted to find this one just to show um, how much was actually put back into the community um, jobs and income-wise through residents being engaged in our survey. I think that is it. Great. Thank you, Sheena. That was really excellent and comprehensive. Most of this is a little bit of an echo. What I'm going to do. All right. So we have gone over time by one minute, but I want to make sure that we're able to cover um, questions and answer. So if folks could type in any questions that you have.
for the presenters now, and then we will have Q&A. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go over a couple of key um, questions to really summarize what we've um, learned. And so these are a set of questions. They're by no means um, everything that you should be asking, but they're a couple of carefully selected questions um, for you to consider in your work um, to help really think about how to achieve deeper integration of uh, youth families and communities in your work. The first is, uh, are community members involved in designing, administering, and disseminating the community survey and its results? So you heard from Sheena uh, how um, the community residents have been involved in the community survey. Um, a number of other sites have also um, shared some of the work that they've done around that, including DCPNI uh, during the Promise Neighborhoods convening. Um, so that's one thing to, to really consider as an avenue uh, for uh, not only getting the results, but also uh, connecting residents to one another and empowering them to understand um, what's going on in the neighborhood. Uh, the second question is, are community members at the table in meetings where solutions are proposed and where partners are held accountable? Um, so you heard from uh, Sheena uh, and also from Tanya how community members have really taken the initiative and um, begun to lead their own solutions. Um, that are aligned with the mission of the Promise Neighborhood, but that are um, that are that are also incredibly impactful and unique. And so, by making sure that they're, that they're at the table, um, these solutions can be part of the discussion. The third thing is: Do community members have specific aligned contributions that they are accountable for, and can they view their progress data? Um, so this is very important in the sense. Uh, and so we heard from both presenters how that was achieved. Um, and in particular, the Fair Chance um, program from uh, Dudley Street, the Boston Promise Initiative, and how folks could really look at uh, how they were doing um, at their progress in real time um, to be able to make sure that they were um, taking responsibility for and held accountable for um, achieving uh, a result. Next, are community members and youth represented on your board? Um, so this is really, really important, and I think um, Dudley Street is a great model of really making sure that there are specific um, specific slots for um, achieving a diverse board that represents the community. Um, next, are community members represented among your organization staff and leadership? Um, so this is very crucial. Um, so looking at your organization um, and your leadership, are the community members reflected? Um, is it diverse? Um, do they really reflect the interests, the needs, the values, equitable? Um, all of that is important to building credibility and making sure that decisions are aligned with the interests of the community. Um, and then finally, are there diverse, meaningful opportunities to build the capacity of community members to perform these roles? Um, are there leadership development programs? Uh, are folks trained in results-based accountability? Um, these are all questions to be asking. And so finally, I'm going to go to a set of resources uh, that PNI uh, offers um, related to this. So, a couple of months ago, we released a PNI peer learning tool. Um, so, I'm going to bring that up now. And basically, what this offers is what it gives you a snapshot of what other sites are doing, uh, really, models that other sites are using um, across all of the result areas and core competencies, including community engagement. So you can see Dudley Street here, description of their work and uh, Sheena's contact information. You can see Buffalo Promise Neighborhood, a description of their community engagement work, a contact information, as well as a number of other sites. And so this is accessible from the Promise Neighborhoods Institute page. You go to technical assistance and peer learning tool. Um, some other resources to consider. Um, PN, this is actually the third. Um, webinar on community engagement that PNI has done. We did two uh, webinars actually way back in 2011 that were really focused on um, sites that were planning to do this work, um, but that contain a lot of uh, rich information um, and skills um, and tips for engaging the community in planning processes. And so that's all accessible again by the Promise Neighborhoods Institute page. Um, this time you go to um, webinars, webinar archives, and then you can see webinar series, Planning a Promise Neighborhood um, and Community Engagement. And so there you can see two webinars and the recordings are there. And then finally, um, PNI has also produced a community engagement brief which really captures a lot of the learnings of uh, some of the initial um, planning sites as well as the Harlem Children's Zone and other um, community 
uh, collective impact um, work going on across the country. And so to access that, it's under resource library. Um, going to beyond lessons in the field, and then community engagement in promised neighborhoods. And so with that, finally looking at questions, we have um, one question here from Caleb. It's, does Community Planet work on mobile devices? So um, this is for you, Sheena. Hi. That is, does Community Planet work on mobile devices? I, um, that's a good question. I can find out. But I will, I'll just say I would assume so. It it's, um, comes through the Emerson Engagement Lab, Emerson College here. And so they really created it to be dynamic and for um, to really kind of start to evolve the world of community of community planning, community organizing, I should say. And so I would imagine that it does. Um, I can actually I'll I have to look for a second, but Sam, I'll put in the um, chat box some um, the the link to it. Sounds good. So um, I guess I'll pause and see if there is one last question before uh, we end today. So we have a response to the question from uh, Danubia Campos, uh, who's saying the Community Planet works on iPads. Um, and I should also say that this is uh, one of uh, many similar tools that are being piloted in communities now, um, some of which work on mobile devices and others which don't. I know um, there's something going on here in Oakland called um, uh, BTEC. Um, Streetwise, and that's a similar program in terms of allowing people to um, really map out what they want in a community and what existing resources are there um, across the various um, areas of health, um, and infrastructure, and other things. And so this is something to look at, and, and as we um, identify more, more programs like this, um, we'll be sure to share it. So thank you for everybody who's participated today. Um, sorry that we went over a little bit, and um, I'll see you next webinar. And thank you to the presenters.